Hello, welcome back to my blog, Edis English Literature. I am Ardhendu De. Today, we are going to discuss some important points regarding figure of speech, the rhetoric. We will sum up the discussions in different categories and different sections, and today is part one. So, don't waste our time. Let's begin. Learning rhetoric or art of speaking had been the culture at the ancient Greek. In the time of Aristotle, he has defined rhetoric as a faculty by which we understand what we will serve our turn concerning any subject we believe in the hearer. In fact, uh, the Greek queens, kings as well as princes must have to learn the art of speaking. If they fail to do so, the elegance and force of their rule might have a weakening force. Now, such speaking quality or the artistry of speaking has not been ignored till date. In fact, as a student, we must learn what is rhetoric and how it is important in understanding a poem. Taking into broader view, when we take into an another text of William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, there we find Antony and Brutus. Both are telling their facts of murdering or, or they are making some uh, rightful explanation on the murder of Julius Caesar. But their presentation, their oration at Roman stage or Roman Empire and their explanation of doing the act has made the possible of mutiny for the part of Antony. But Brutus has failed as an orator. In fact, instantly the Roman mob revolted against this uh, so-called action of Brutus and the mutiny happened. Now, taking all this into account, it is quite justified that as a student we must learn what the rhetoric is and how it is important in our daily life of speaking even if we are not a great like that of princes queens or kings but in ordinary living if we want to thrive into better future we must entertain the rhetorical part of our speaking to understand a poem, we must learn what the rhetoric is. Rhetoric is an art which has the intention of showing the feelings or emotions of hearer or reader. As Aristotle says, the primary objective of our rhetorical presentation is to make a good and graceful composition. Whatever we say or write, that will capable us with the power to persuade or to convince the listener or the reader with the intended goal. But how far the rhetoric is different from grammar? Grammar usually tells the syntax, the mechanism, the structure or in pronunciation part or in punctuation part the very order of words but in rhetoric it is quite extended grammar a grammar that will arrest into our psychology it makes a speech with more correctness with more embellishment the grammaticality of a sentence is it correctness its semanticality its order of presentation but in rhetoric it is added with emblems, with polish, with more grace. So the function of the rhetoric as if like that of a beautifying a woman with attire, with proper dress up, with proper makeup. Isn't it that the girl 
who is without attire is not beautiful but it intensified the more it intensified the beauty so the beauty of a sentence is not the rhetoric but the entire structure of the sentence that is grammaticality but it enhances the beauty the part which the rhetoric serves here is the more layers of beauty or more beauty now in that sense it is quite different from that of the mechanics of so figures of speech that is rhetorical ornaments that are we often use as like that of a clothes as like that of a beauty elements is called figure of speech it is a deviation from the plain and ordinary way of speaking and the purpose is quite simple to make it a greater impact to the listener or to the writer so the speaker and the writer with the weapon of figure of speech with the weapon of rightful rhetoric learn to express his thought express his senses in different way that moves simply the listener and the reader so remarkable and impressive language that is stuffed with rhetoric is a ultimate decoration of the language it beautifies a language and it becomes a entity it becomes a pillar of success for longer survival of the language so as a reader of poetry as well as literature we must learn the basics of the rhetoric and how it functions properly so to make our understanding proper literature in a nutshell is a sum total of words that we divide in the form of poetry drama or in stories essays everywhere there are the words and its presentation and the very in the very presentation part we can find out the rap and oop the very rapper the very expressive way of presentation and that is figure of speech or the rhetoric but rhetoric is not only a single term it can have its different way of embracing one's language and there are different classes of figures here we can find out that it can be classified by in division according to its origin or according to its function based on intellectual or having illustrative value we can devise this figure of speech by resemblance by difference by association on the imagination planks we can have different figure of speech in reserving the statement we can have another sort of so division from some different criteria we can find out different figure of speech in simplified way we can say that there are some figure of speech which are based on similarity there are some on association there are some figures on contrast or differences there are some figures based on imagination there are some figures based on indirectness there are some figures on sounds and of construction so such classes of figures uh, when we uh, make them in use in a particular language in its different way uh, we can find out the meanings of their the similarity the association the contrast or difference imagination indirectness sound or construction all these metrics or uh, designing parameters have to be turned uh, so to view figure of speech in its totality how many figure of speech are there or 
um, to understand its uh, relations between them so uh, we can have a better look of all these associations or all, all these um, uh, figurative design so uh, if i say uh, that these are a needful classifications uh, that we must have to and now taking on uh, the issue i will take uh, rather a mouthpiece of each and every parameters separately in letter sections but what is the relations of similar these that we can classify into the first section uh, the impressive and effective statement is delivered in these kind of sentences in this kind of utterances or writing in which in which similarities between two different kind of objects are made so in the association we can find out a particular thing is expressed to say to state into the another so the different two things are related one thing is said and another thing is meant so it is a matter of association in the case of imagination we can find some impressive expression in which uh, the author play the part of imagination in its articulation or saying in the fourth section that we are also discussing is of imaginative or giving an imaginative idea or wings to something abstract is also is into this case in the figures like indirectness we will find out some ideas or facts that are stated in direct not so direct references to this in the sixth classes that will it's a kind of a designing of sounds that is more a part of prosody than rhetoric uh, but it is covering both the lines so uh, it is also included it's a, a kind of a metrical design sound design rather in terms of poetry in the case of poetry in the last section that we will find out it is a matter of construction how the sentence is constructed and in that construction we can have the basic things the construction of words the construction is given in such a way that the meaning it carries sometime makes a heavier sometimes it makes a lighter so all these uh, kind of uh, different associations or different metrics that are making the full design of the rhetorics are to be understood separately but covering up all these rhetorical forms or groups we would say that based on similarity we will find out five major rhetorical terms that is simile metaphor allegory parable and fable on the based on association we will find metronomy sine doce transparent epithet and allusion on the based of contrast we will find antithesis epigram oxymoron climax anticlimax and condensed sentences on the based of imagination so popular personification apostrophe pathetic fallacy personal metaphor vision hyperbole on the based of indirectness we will find unando irony periphrase euphemism on the based of sound we will find pan onomatopoeia alliteration asone and on the based of construction we will find interrogation exclamation Hasmas, Sigma, Handwed, Hetutes, Hyperbaton, Ascendaton, Polystaton, Hyphenophora, and Palilog. In our this section, we will rather concentrate our lecture on similarity. So we will primarily discuss simile, metaphor, allegory, 
comparable and favorable. We'll state the classifications, the definition, and we will explain different examples. And we will also try to understand the interrelation between these figure of speeches. Simile is a figure of speech based on similarity. The comparison between two unallied things. We first have to remember what is unallied objects. The objects that are not related to. Suppose somebody is compared to another person. So the category is the same, the human. So it is not comparable. But when the things are different, suppose in Robert Burns' poem, my love is like a red, red rose. So here, beloved and the rose, two different categories are compared to each other. And it is made explicit by the use of the word like. So the essential features of similes that there should have been a comparison and the comparison between two unallied or unlike objects. The point of comparison is distinctly visible. As we can find out such words like as, so, as, like, resemble and such on. So when we find the text, a line of the poem, if, if we find out the two unallied objects and the point of comparison is understood and the comparison made words such as, uh, so, as, like, resemble is find out, we can easily distinguish it as simile. The close to simile uh, like uh, that of epic simile another, the grandeur is greater, which is made popular by Homer. The simile or the point of comparison is extended to a greater platform, to a greater extension. In Paradise Lost, you can also find out from Milton's text uh, the great and exquisite epic similes. Now, the common literary practice of this kind of uh, similes is for a literary practice of excellence, a beautification of the language. So, understanding simile will make the burden ease, while most of the text of the poem is copying uh, the style of simile expressions. Now, let us take some examples to uh, cl clarify all these points. Glory is like a circle in the water which never cease to enlarge itself, till by broad spreading it disperses to naught. This Shakespearean line, we can find out the two unallied objects or abstract ideas, the glory and the circle. Glory and the circle is compared to each other here with the point of its ever enlarging sphere. So, the point of comparison is made explicit here by the use of the word, uh, use of the word like that you can find out in the first line. Take for another example, the tangled mind stems score the sky like strings of broken layers. This hardy uh, line from the dark in Thas is compared is uh, stated that bind stems, the tangled bind stems, in fact, and the string of broken layers are compared to each other. And the point of comparison is made explicit by the use of the word like. So, the point of comparison is drawn in that sense that bind stems that are entangled and scoring the sky is like that of a layers whose strings are broken. So is the dejected atmosphere. So the somber atmosphere or the bad sad mood of the atmosphere or the wintry landscape is being compared to that of uh, natural landscape of Einstein. So the point of comparison which has been explicit by the use of the word like and its proper explanation is also needed while explaining it any kind of explanatory notes that we can find out. We have to give a proper explanation of that. Uh, which we can find out in simile. Take for another example, 
else distilled books are like common distilled waters. Flashy things. This Baconia line from Upstar is where distilled books and distilled waters are compared to each other. Distilled books, the books which have the category of taking its gist point and the distilled water which is filtered one is both compared to each other and the point of comparison is made explicit by this use of the word light and the point of comparison in its thematic understanding is that that distilled books and distilled waters are flashy things that means tasteless things or which is gross one so while taking similes for explanation in our understanding we can take uh, ready-made explanation how these unlight objects are related to it and how the point of comparison is being used uh, by the like words like that of like as and such things and we have to understand the basic matrix of the um, or the very design of the sentence structure by which all these things are related to so now shift to another one metaphor Metaphor can be told as an implied comparison or implied simile. So the two sets of different objects or ideas that are compared here cannot be uh, told explicitly, rather implied comparison is said. So the words that uh, shows the comparison like that of the as, so, like, these are missing here. So in a metaphoric statement, we have to identify two sets of objects and we have to understand the implied comparison underneath. But the word that shows the comparison is missing here. For example, if I say from Tennyson's, I will drink life to the lease. So here, poets uh, comparison of drinking life or taking the life merriment uh, to that of a drunkard. As a drunkard, uh, it's at the very end drop of the glass of his wine. Similarly, the poet wishes to enjoy the mirth of the life. So such kind of a, uh, examples can be readily summed up. Uh, if I say, um, uh, this rudeness is a sauce to his good wit. Uh, so the uh, sauce and the rudeness are compared to each other in an implied version because uh, the very mode of comparison that it makes ex um, explicit uh, that is uh, the word like as like so such things are missing here so we can take a few examples more to give a, a ready-made uh, explanation of all these for uh, taking it uh, the first example let me not star you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny so the very a uh, line of comparison is uh, here that the implied comparison is here between the two unallied things the two things are one flood and another is mutiny two different set of things and the mode of comparison is here and uh, the parallel comparison is here in respect of force uh, so the comparison is uh, a ready-made example of metaphor Similar kind of uh, examples can be seen here in mm. another example, if I say uh, the thou darch of the dying year to his disclosing night will be the dome of a vast sepulchre. So this salient line is here, the closing night and the dome of a vast sepulchre. These two unallied objects are made compared here. The comparison is implied here. So it's a clear case of metaphor. Another example can be taken, uh, loneliness is young ambition's ladder. This Shakespearean line, the loneliness and the ladder, to an unallied elements are compared. Here the point of comparison is explicit, not explicit, but rather implied or implicit. And here, as a young man can prosper in his life, his loneliness, the attitude of taking the acceptance or 
uh, taking uh, everything uh, granted is like that of a ladder that he can take to achieve his ambition. So this kind of suicide example can be uh, explained through metaphor. So uh, metaphor can be told uh, a little bit of uh, less a simile, rather a, a simile which is devoid of any um, kind of uh, comparisons explicit. Rather it is an implied simile we can really say it. Now there is another kind of uh, metaphor that we call mixed metaphor, where uh, this is a corruption of metaphor that we can that we can uh, tell it. This arises uh, when the metaphors here is also the different kind of sources are combined in the same subject, but in an inappropriate use of metaphors, where uh, the metaphors the objects are not. Uh, unallied objects or rather not different kind of same set of objects are compared to each other these kind of uh, metaphors are called mixed metaphors uh, that uh, we can have uh, also uh, in the um, some kind of uh, lines in poetry uh, to take an example from Shakespeare to take up arms against a sea of travel uh, this is a mixed metaphor again uh, we can take another set of example which is called strained metaphor which is uh, the comparison is so far-fetched so dragged that the root points of comparison is missing this kind of faulty or uh, strained metaphors are there there is another kind of metaphor that are often told that is called dead metaphors the dead metaphors are shown the common usage discrepancy we can find out here uh, the set of comparisons are between two of set of objects but the comparison is logically not binding that is called uh, that is why it is called the dead metaphor so we can have uh, the reference the heart of a matter the leg of a table uh, these kind of metaphors can be told as a uh, dead metaphors so all these set of metaphors that I to, we are told we are discussing like that of a dead metaphor or strained metaphor or mixed metaphors are a little bit variations and off, off track of that rhetoric which is known as uh, metaphor genuine. There is another kind of metaphor which John Dryden said in his discourse concerning satire about John Donne and his class of poetry that it affects the metaphysics. In fact, John Donne employs the terminology and abstruse argument of the medieval scholastic philosophers. So, uh, Samuel Johnson later extended the term metaphysical uh, from John Donne to the school of poetry uh, and in a acute and balanced critic uh, in which he explains the very concept of metaphysical concepts or metaphysical poetry in general that he has extended the very comparisons and dragged it into a metaphysical wit with a lot of witty punches, uh, with a lot of uh, religious uh, experiences, with ingenious use of paradox, pun, startling parallels, uh, even uh, there is some similes, the metaphors. So, in all of this metaphysical school of poetry, we can find out a kind of rhetorical embellishment. Uh, which is called metaphysical conceits which is quite parallel to that of metaphor and to an extent there is simile but the logic or syllogistic argument that they prefer uh, is so arguably extended that sometimes the very you know, math of learning is quite missing uh, in metrical uh, design in metrical sonorous uh, musicality or all sort of 
poetic balance is sometimes uh, a gauze violation somewhere in metaphysical concepts but they are intellectually beautiful and that beauty can be seen in a rhetorical term that is known as metaphysical concept but the boundary between the metaphor or it is another known that it is called extended metaphor but that metaphor or metaphysical concept is quite beyond the boundary of general rhetoric rather a complex argumentative representations of metaphysical school of poetry so uh, arguably it can be taken or can be omitted from the class of figure of speeches for example here we can uh, take um, a few of the examples you can find out uh, in john dan particularly here in this benedicts and forbidding money you can find out um, the two lovers are compared to be the, the two legs of a compass uh, similar kind of references are there from and marvel where lovers are um, compared to be unified ball uh, so such references or complex ideas are called metaphysical concepts allegory can be seen as a narrative it might be in prose or verse the accents are set in well knit plot and the author here significant way want to tell a story but he is to tell a story underneath and there is a correlation between that kind of orderly significance so the basic point that it arguably states that there is a comparison there is a tale which is told but which is meant to be in another parallel level another that has a significance now what is told literally and what is meant there is a balanced relation between these two things so it's a figure of speech on similarity and uh, that can be uh, extended into different categories allegorical examples can be from history from politicals if we take political and historical examples uh, we can find john dryden's absolute and achitopo here uh, charles to is king david and absalom he represents his son duke of monmouth the so the biblical story of absalom's rebellion against his father is being retold in a new political way of the then time history in john bunyan's the pilgrims progress we can find out christian as if a story as if a name the story is the christian doctrine of salvation and it is being represented through a character so it's a religious kind of allegory so allegorical ideas can be different it may be political it may be historical it may be religious so different set of allegorical references are given so to extend our discussion in fairy queen princess fairy queen here a kind of moral religious sentiment historical data political version of his ideologies are all represented in a allegorical romance mode the galliver stable by jonathan swift is also a allegorical story a satire rather the philosophical and scientific pedantic of that time society has been criticized in galliver's travel so galliver's travel even though it started with a satire but it ends as a beautiful travel of that's another kind of discussion so
so we can tell allegory as a kind of uh, rhetoric that is based on similarity parable is a short allegorical story a very short narrative in fact about human beings presented so as to trace the tactics analogy or parallel and uh, it aims at teaching a moral this is uh, in fact uh, a short narrative that is implicit but there is an external outline and a inner sense or a lesson is conveyed throughout the narrative and the narrator through this allegorical story often delivers a high moral lesson and that moral lesson is related to religion and morality we can have a short story there is an analogy and religious and moral instruction is imbibed most of the religious texts in bible are taught through parables so christ parables are there so is in buddhist stories particularly sutta pitika in which parables of poison arrow is most famous we can also have the parables of good samaritans the parable of prodigal son the parable of the sour from biblical stories Fable is a kind of a short story that uh, is mostly concerning irrational animals and it has like that of allegorical and parable stories has a high moral and that moral goes parallel with the the stories are often fictitious narrative kind and the animal characters and their habits are mostly parallel to human beings or rather animal characters are treated as human beings so the moral is intended for teaching the mankind a particular le- that kind of fables are often uh, goes way back to the and still it is being continued and fable is still giving traditional educational platform to the common mass in parable stories we can find out most of the characters speaking or having a human capability and qualities teaching a particular lessons is of fables there are the stories that include the lion and the mouse the hare and the tortoise the pope's famous poem the town mouse and the country mouse chosar the nan pirish tale these are all a kind of beast fables or fable so in these fables or in this um, uh, there is notably another piece that is george orwell's animal farm find out a beast fable a sustained satire on the political and social situation in the mid 20th century so all of these three categories allegory parable and fables are figures based on similarity they all have a detailed analogies and are for a teaching purpose they are written for a teaching purpose in the parable the teaching is highly moral or religious as we find in the religious text in the case of fable there is a moral 
and in allegory which is a larger canvas the teaching is always not in the sense of religion or in morality purpose but it may be extended to political and satirical too so in this diagram we can see the differences the slightest are they in terms of volumes allegory is larger one parables and fables are shorter versions and in all of the three categories teaching is the main purpose whereas in allegory it is implied but in the parable and fables the teaching is direct one so in our discussion of figure of speech of similarities uh, that we have roughly covered similes metaphors and, and different categories of metaphors allegories fables and parables if there is any question regarding all these uh, figure of speech you can just pop up some questions i will try my best to answer it and stay tuned like share and subscribe